This is Authentic. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this special presentation of Authentic Media. Uh, I'm Scott Roger Chafian, Chief Content Officer of Authentic. And here with me today is Matt Flounder Arney. Hi, Flounder. Hey, Roger. Great to see you today. You too. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm a retired naval officer, spent 20 years as a surface warfare officer, uh, driving Aegis ships, cruisers, and destroyers, as well as picking up rating as a military historian and working in the anti-terrorism field. Matt, give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, thanks, Roger. I come from a background of flying F-14s and F-18s in the Navy. I was at F-14 Rio and then turned Super Hornet Wizzo. And so I retired last year out of the Navy, out of commanding NAS Woodby Island. But in my time in the Navy, I also was assistant navigator and enterprise ran operations on the uh, Abraham Lincoln. And so a wide variety of things also was in the embassy in Stockholm and in United Arab Emirates. So that's my background and I'm looking forward to getting into our topic today for a brief conversation. Awesome. Yeah. So we're here for a short talk on the considerations of operating a carrier strike group or more than one carrier strike group and or amphibious ready group in the Eastern Mediterranean. Obviously, we're doing this because of the situation between Israel and Hamas in Gaza and Israel. And as we're recording this, there's one strike group on station and another headed out to the region. And with that, I'm going to say up front, this is all about the operational considerations of operating carriers over there. We are not taking a political stance on the conflict on the ground, nor are we taking a political stance on sending the carriers, though we may discuss what potential roles they may have. And with that in mind, we'll just jump right into it. Flounder, can you describe for us the operating conditions in the Eastern Med or Eastern Mediterranean? We'll just be calling it the Eastern Med. Sure. Yeah, the Eastern Med, it's an interesting area um, in that subset of the Mediterranean. You know, when you look at just distances alone from the Ionian Sea to the, I, I think kind of there's a, uh, it's in the Levant there, Le, the Levantian Sea, but really we just call it the Eastern Med. That mm -hmm. area, particularly from south of Cyprus to the shores of Lebanon, uh, Syria, Israel, um, you know, it looks pretty good on the map when you look at, at an aircraft carrier, but really <laughs> when you get into it, you know, you've got, look at all the surface traffic. You have uh, ships coming in and out of the Suez Canal. Uh, so if you just look at the map and consider going, coming out of the Suez and heading either north to ports of Turkey or northwest across the Mediterranean, you've got those kind of sea lanes. And then you've got the, um, you know, the distances there. When you look at the area from Cyprus to Syria, the shores of Syria there, that's 80 miles. That's going to be pretty north. I wouldn't expect to see carriers operating around there, but I did fly and operate in that area uh, a few times. But really where we expect to see them is down, down south and out to sea. And so that, that border, if we look at from the border of, let's say the north border of Israel, the Israel-Lebanon border down to the Gaza Strip, that's about 190 miles. So if you think about the distance from Washington DC to New York City, or maybe if you're on the west coast of the US from San Diego up to and just past Santa Barbara, you know, that's the that's the north-south distance that we're talking about. And so right. you, you, need, you need sea space, you need airspace to operate aircraft carriers, and you've got air routes going through there from all the different hubs as well. So a lot of, lot of considerations in both airspace and sea space in that area. Right. Um, I also have operated over in that area and it is, it's 80 miles sounds like a lot when you get up north, but even further down south, as you said, uh, you have to stay clear of merchant traffic. There are territorial water and airspace considerations. The generally accepted limit is 12 miles. So if you do look at that tightest bit, which as you said, I don't anticipate seeing uh, our strike groups operating at this point, you could take 24 miles off that 80, right? Bringing you down to, to even under 60 miles. And the other consideration, of course, when we're operating over there is weather. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Now, this is not a time of year I have operated a lot in the Eastern Med. Did, did you get much sort of late uh, late fall, early winter over there? Yeah, I sure did. Because for me, with my luck, all the times I was going through the med, it was usually in the wintertime. I never got that glorious yeah. summer med cruise. But yeah, so I've, I have operated in the Eastern Med in this time of year. And it, it can it can be rough, you know. It's it's mm-hmm. uh, it can be windy you, when you get into more like um, the Adriatic and stuff like that. It can get really choppy when, and that's that's further to the northwest. Uh, but in the area there, you've got some fetch for, so it might not be as as choppy. But the sea state can get up there, and and the winds can you know start howling a bit. So it can it can get a little dicey out there. Right, and. In all of this, what we're talking about are carriers having to operate in, I'll, you know, we'll go back and uh, not sure they're still, still using the same terminology or if they're going to use it over there, but CVOAs or carrier operating areas, as they became known in the various conflicts in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, which are usually boxes or some sort of, of uh, geometric shape within which a carrier is going to conduct operations. And what really makes it challenging, and I'll I'll say this coming from the surface warfare officer perspective, and then Flounder let you talk about what it means for air ops, is as we all know, a a carrier generally has to turn into the wind to launch and recover aircraft. So unlike say uh, the Western Med or better yet the Atlantic or Indian or Pacific oceans where you could pretty much transit from where where you are to where you wanna be, and just turn into the wind when you need to conduct flight operations. When you're in a ge- uh, geographically constrained area, you have to make sure that you are at the extreme portion of your downwind leg when you uh, start flight operations, which means when you're done with the flight operations, you pretty much have to turn around and run for the other end of the box, taking all, all of your escorts with you. So it makes it a little bit challenging and it does telegraph your moves a little bit to anyone who's watching you. Yeah, anybody who's got any experience out there watching aircraft carriers operations, then they they know that they're gonna be con- constrained to that. You know, there's only so much you can do between cycles of launching and recovering aircraft to really displace the carrier. And like you said, you know, you'll you'll try to make up as much ground as you can, but through the flight schedule, you'll probably kind of trend one way or another. The nice thing with higher winds, higher natural winds is you you don't have to make as much speed in the water because the natural wind is doing it. So that's kind of one of those things where you're not gonna be eating up sea space. The CVOAs, as you mentioned, so they they would be drawn by like the fleet staff or the or the strike group staff and getting fleet approval. And um, they're probably already established because recall, you know, in, in the war, uh, in our conflict within Syria, we were operating carriers out of the East Med, you know, into Syria mm-hmm. and into Western Iraq. So they're probably very well established so that any surface traffic kind of knows where the carriers typically operate. Those CVOAs are not uh, not some, not some international standard where merchant ships avoid. I mean, they can cut right through that thing. So you still have to deal mm-hmm. with, you know, merchant traffic crossing your path and all those other kind of nautical, you know, rules of the road situations out there. Right. Had, you know, the various hazards of driving ships in, in constrained waters. Yeah. But of course, we're out there and, and the carrier is surrounded by a number of escorts. Uh, each strike group has a slightly varied mix of uh, usually at least one cruiser and then multiple destroyers. But the reason those escorts are there are to protect the carrier, which is our power projection platform or main presence platform to protect them from multiple threats. What are those threats uh, in general? Not saying that any one country is posing a threat to us out there, but in general, the ships, the, the strike group, the destroyer squadron embarked, the individual CEOs of the ships, of course, are always looking to protect themselves, protect the carrier. What are those threats they're looking at in a military sense? So you've got, you know, you've got your air threats out there um, any kind of attack aircraft, you've got your um, kind of missiles, surf, uh, surface-to-surface missiles that might be coming from a shoreline, stuff like that. And then you've got your surface threats, uh, your classic Corvettes and, and those things, um, small boats. And, uh, you know, we can get into more of the 
kind of terrorist style threats as a as a subset of those areas. And then you got your subsurface mm-hmm. threats to your submarines, mines, those kinds of things. If we look in the context of the Israel Hamas war going on right now, um, you know, that's another an, another uh, benefit of the carry strike group has. They're not going to be operating right up the shore, up that 12 mile territorial limit. They're going to be displaced out to sea. So really conceivably out of the reach of any kind of Hamas shore launched um, uh, weaponry or small boats right. and things like that. So really not mm-hmm. anticipating that being an aspect, uh, you know, always wondering what they might come up right. with, but feeling pretty confident due to that distance. Right. And at this point, I don't think we've seen any threats warning or indications that our strike group would be targeted. And by nature of what you just described, the distance from shore, the potential for a mistake, uh, while always there, is minimized in terms of uh, mistaken ID, Mm -hmm. say, should one side or the other choose to launch it, what they thought was was, uh, their actual enemy and not a U.S. force. Yeah, which, you know, so, go, going back really quick to some people might think about the USS Liberty incident in the mm-hmm. late 60s, different context, you know, that was mm-hmm. well, that was a while ago, a few decades ago, right. and the situation has evolved over time. So that's where Israel um, actually uh, employed munitions on USS Liberty out there, mistaking it mm-hmm. for an Egyptian uh, surface vessel. And so right. we're we're not really anticipating that because the situation has changed politically in the area that, you know, Israel's going to be probably very focused on Hamas in the Gaza Strip mm-hmm. uh, militarily. And so I'm I'm feeling pretty good as a destroyer CEO out there. I'm I'm not thinking that Israel's going to be coming out and making some kind of mistake like that again this time. Right. And I, I don't I don't want to go off onto a tangent. I will just recognize for any of you listeners who are familiar with the Liberty incident, I know there are a lot of strong feelings around it about Mm -hmm. what happened, why it happened. We're not trying to discount that at all. I think Flounder's point is exactly on point though, which is that these are universally in our strike group combatant ships that bear no relationship to any ship that is going to be out there from Hamas. Hamas simply does not have ships of that size to be mistaken one way or the other. None of the other players with navies right now are looking to be in the region. And as far as we know, are not showing any hostile intent to Israel. So I think that that is a threat that while everyone's always going to be aware of a mistaken attack is not the highest likelihood we could see. But having said that, once our units are out there, once the strike groups are out there, what could their purpose be? What is the what is the mission of sending a strike group and or an amphibious ready group to the region? Yeah, the stated mission being to make sure that uh, no other parties will engage in this war between Israel and Hamas. It's really the presence out there, which you know the 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 projection of power that the U.S. has to take the Ford carrier strike group that was operating in the Ionian Sea and just move it east and and publicly state that we are moving that there to make sure that no other parties try to enter the conflict. And so, you know, that alone can be enough. It, it, it causes leaders of other nations to think very hard about it. Yes. And so now combine that with the ARG, uh, there are some amphibious ships there, uh, so we can get into some neo implications, the non-combat, non-combatant evacuation operations um, that we've seen uh, amphibious ready group, readiness groups do in the past. So that's an option with so many American citizens in the area. And then also we've got the Eisenhower Care Strike Group, as you said, that was on a regularly scheduled deployment, left 14th of October from mm-hmm. Norfolk Hampton Roads and is on their way over there. And so we could see in a week dual carrier operations plus an amphibious ready, readiness group there. So that's a lot of power to make leaders think twice about joining in this conflict between Israel and Hamas. Right. 
Exactly. And I'll just add to that that with all of the large deck ships, the the Ford, the Eisenhower, the big deck fib that's coming with the amphibious ready group, and particularly the amphibs, there's a robust medical capability. So should there be some sort of neo operation? I know people generally think of uh, when we have to evacuate an embassy or, or such, but it's not exclusive to that. We know there are Americans on the ground. Uh, it, I get, I don't want to get into the political implications of that, but there are Americans on the ground in danger. And if they are uh, released, extracted, any other type of release and need medical attention, this puts them in the hands of the United States with a very robust forward medical capability and the ability to very rapidly transport them to the most definitive care in the world, be that at a, a US or NATO base in Europe or even all the way back to the United States if need be. Yeah, I think that's something that gets overlooked on the amphibious ready group capabilities is that uh, they are small hospitals, in fact. That's right. Um, and obviously, in that amphibious warfare environment, environment, you're expecting to take a lot of casualties. So there's there's a lot of casualty mm -hmm. care capability on there. Right. Uh, when we look at, in a, just to give people an understanding of the scale that we're talking about when it comes to NEO, you know, there's 200,000, from what I, I've read, is uh, U.S. citizens in Israel. And when we did the NEO operation in 2006 at Lebanon, it was summertime. We had uh, assets that were moved over there, uh, amphibious assets, and I think of Mount Whitney maybe. But 15,000 people were evacuated, and that was very challenging to get 15,000 mm -hmm. people out in the matter of, uh, I think from the first incident to actually evacuating was about a week and then two weeks of evacuations to get 15,000 people out. There were a lot of complications. Right. It was summertime. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people were evacuated Cyprus and so not a lot of hotel capability. And, and these ships, though they have these great capabilities, you can't take that number of people on board. So we're talking about Right. Overall, we're not going to evacuate 200,000 citizens out of Israel. I mean, it's just some kind of discrete group that we could then support mm -hmm. in, in that way. Right, exactly. So given that and what we've talked about, we do think that the overall threat to the force that is there is low. But there, of course, are considerations. Anytime you send armed forces into a conflict region, you want to minimize and mitigate any chance of undesired conflict. And at this point, I think the American position, I not being political, but I think it's fair to say the American position as stated by our chain of command is to de-escalate the conflict to the maximum extent possible. So for the COs and crews of those ships, that really comes down to uh, rules of engagement or ROE. And as I said at the top, we're not to even touch on any OPSEC issues. So I'm not even going to speculate on what the ROE for the ships may be, but I think we can talk about what ROE is and some general concepts and some constants in ROE for CEOs of ships and aircrew commanders. Yeah, so there we always have that in, inherent right of self-defense, and that's not only defense of ourselves. Let's say I'm a destroyer CEO out there in company with the carrier and I'm displaced east of the carrier, and I've got what I see as an unknown track coming at me, and I get intelligence that tells me that there's some kind of hostile intent on that track, and it gets to a point where there is maybe a hostile act that's being committed at me, then I can certainly retaliate. Um, hopefully, our command structure would provide more guidance before it gets to actual uh, employment to be able to defend ourselves. But it's not only that, it's also the right to be able to defend um, our, my other assets out there too. So so there is that that goes into it when you talk about ROE. And so, um, and so really, I the way I'm thinking of it, and I always try to put myself like we just did in the shoes of somebody on a on a bridge of a ship or strapping into mm -hmm. an airplane how is that person being enabled and empowered to be able to make decisions because that's what we do we let people go out there very highly trained and allow them to make decisions out there at the tip of the spear and so um so i'm sure that there's some other complexities of of eastern mediterranean specific roe but 
again, going back to the greater context of the situation and what the expectation is of our forces that are being deployed there, I think it come, boils down to that kind of generic ROE. Right. And it's worth pointing out that we hear a lot about workups and, and squadrons and ships and strike groups doing workups all the time before they deploy. And that's a lot of what they're doing. They're going through scenario after scenario after scenario of what ifs. So while we'll never have the exact situation that a CEO or a, or a tactical action officer or a pilot or WIZO are going to face, then they're going to have something fairly analogous that they've actually seen before and they can relate to. And the ROE, I believe, in my experience and uh, in the maritime environment with the Navy is that ROE is generally very clear cut. And I don't want to say aggressive because that's the wrong word, but it is appropriately staged to defend U.S. assets, let's see. Yeah, the situation specific, and um, and and also, again, this is not our first day operating in this area. Mm -hmm. You probably have multiple uh, people on all those ships in those squadrons who've been operating in that area the past four or five years in the uh, conflicts that have been going on that we've been operating from the East Med. So a lot of familiarity. Obviously, a little bit of nuance now with the uh, Israeli-Hamas uh, war going on, but um, but I, I, I I'm thinking they know when they get in the in the airplanes and and piloting and on their bridge watch, they know what to expect. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I guess we'll we'll sort of wrap with a little bit of conjecture, mm. uh, and neither of us know the future. Neither of us have any inside line. But I think between the two of us, close to 50 years of uh, peacetime, low intensity conflict uh, experience. What if somebody decides to join the fight? What does that look like for a carrier strike group and or an ARG that are positioned there to prevent exactly that? Yeah, that's so that's the next question. You know, as you're as you're getting ready to take off on your mission, like, OK, what if while I'm airborne? somebody decides to throw something over the horizon or or who knows what and then what's going to happen how's it going to escalate and what's my role in it and so um so what I'll, I'll say is that if it does happen uh, you know how much does it involve the whole region going into a hot war that's what we're concerned about mm -hmm. and that's where sure. of course the di diplomacy comes in there's been a lot of effort in the last i mean specifically the last decade on the uh, political relationships between all the all the actors out there and that groundwork mm -hmm. i think is really going to pay off to keep those diplomatic communication lines open to be able to uh to de-escalate something that that might happen. Um, so I, I will say that. So what what if though? Um, I, I don't know. I just I I, I really it, it's tough. You know, I I it, I'm just trying to come up with a scenario in my mind yeah. where I legitimately it, believe that our forces could be acting in a kinetic way over there, and I'm just not coming up with right. it right now. And so, yeah, I, I'm not foreseeing it either. I think I do want to tell the listeners or the viewers rather that along with all the discussion of ROE and all the other training, ROE and any sort of retaliation, and I use that in a very specific uh, maritime law term or, or law of war term, has to be proportional. There's the law of proportionality, and this is something that's drilled into naval and maritime forces. Anytime you're talking about ROE, it, and it's because we realize that in these situations, you need to give diplomacy a chance to work. So if, for example, for some reason, anybody shot a single air-to-air -air missile at one of, say, uh, a cap fighter right off the Ford, any response would have to be proportional to that threat. That, And we, like, Flounder and I are not going to tell you what proportional is. We don't know what proportional is because proportional to some degree comes from the commander in chief down through the service, uh, or rather the combatant commanders, I should say, the secretaries and then the combatant commanders.
but it is very unlikely that you would see a full carrier strike launched against, say, the airfield of origin of an aircraft for launching one air-to-air -air missile. There may be a, another air-to-air -air missile launched back. They may try and shoot down the fighter that launched the missile. Again, all hypothetical. But the proportionality concept is there so that if something happens, it really gives the diplomats an opportunity to say, look, let's let's relax this, relax this back down. Somebody shot a missile, the other side shot a missile back. We can we can talk ourselves down from this and not paint people into a corner. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the you've got surgical strike capability. You've got tomahawks out there. You've mm -hmm. got, you know, a small element of aircraft going to strike something near a shoreline. You know, those kinds of things are on the table when it comes to some kind of proportional response. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the other actors, who, let's let's name the other actors you're concerned about. Obviously, mm -hmm. Iran has been back, backing Hamas through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. There's no way an organization uh, in a, uh, an area that is so overwhelmed by poverty has the ability to to on their own procure these kinds of weapons and these abilities and mm -hmm. the the um, you know the 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 operational security that they went through to do their initial attack on Israel. And so a lot of support there. So, you know, you've got that extension of what is a, you know, that that whole part of the Middle East that mm -hmm. that we continue to be concerned about. We, the collective global community. Uh, and then, right. you know, I'll also just kind of throw out, obviously just to the Northwest, you've got the Ukraine war going on. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we look on a global scale, you've got, China and Taiwan. So it, it all does weave together. You know, the, the people who are making these decisions have to continue to play these three-dimensional chess moves as we look across the globe at all the, the tensions going on and try to mitigate those. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say on this piece is when you look at other participants, uh, a couple of carrier strike groups that we didn't mention, you know, you've got the Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. which last time I checked on there, mm -hmm. Twitter feed or X feed, they're up in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, so I haven't heard anything out of the UK positioning Queen Elizabeth down there. And then you've got the Charles de Gaulle. I'm not sure what Charles de Gaulle is doing, but there's another couple other regional actors that uh, that could come in, depending on how long this situation goes on. Uh, we didn't even get into how do you even do dual carrier flight ops? Are they going to be doing 12 right. on 12 off? Are they doing simultaneous? You know all those kinds of things that they're working out as Eisenhower goes across the pond. So, so lots of right. lots of ways that we could continue this for a few hours uh, in yeah. interesting well, conversation. Yeah. Well, if you guys watching have those questions, let us know through the show links below. And uh, you know, I think Flounder and I'll find the time to answer your questions if they're out there. But Flounder, again, thank you for your time. Uh, anything we anything we missed? Anything you think we need to talk to the listener about? Um, like I said, it would be fun just to, and, and engaging and interesting to just go through this for a few hours. Um, there's there's a, a really mm -hmm. a lot to to talk about. So, but I think we covered kind of the highlights uh, for considerations as people continue to watch the news and see how this progresses. So, uh, so thanks for the opportunity. Well, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it.